Welcome into OneSoccer.ca, everybody. Andy Petrillo, Laura Armstrong, Kale and Kyle with you. We're going to dive right into a juicy topic here. And that, of course, is the huge settlement that was reached between the American women and the U.S. Soccer Federation. This is a fight that has been going on for six years. And it would be actually too much to go through the timeline of events. But yes, six years ago is when they first uh, launched a lawsuit against U.S. soccer. They wanted equal play. Uh, they felt that they were discriminated against when it came to comparison with the men. Jumped to 2020, a federal judge actually dismissed their equal pay arguments. And that was a huge blow to their case. And it basically took a lot of the legal power away from the women. And what do you know? A few years after that, U.S. soccer has now announced a $24 million settlement that is back pay. I guess you can almost say, ladies, a bit of a tacit acknowledgement that they have not paid the women equally to the men. Alex Morgan coming out and saying we wanted acknowledgement that they didn't pay us equally. We got that through this case. And we also want equal pay moving forward. And that is something that they still have to work on because U.S. soccer has said they want to sign one CBA between the men and the women, which means the men who have shown their support, now it's about putting your money where your mouth is, the men now have to agree that whatever bonuses and, and fees that come their way from FIFA, they would be willing to split equally with the women. Kaylin, I'll, I'll begin with you as a former soccer player as well. Your thoughts when you heard that settlement? Yeah, I think it's huge. And I think it, it's not what they asked for. They asked for actually a 66.7 million. Anyways, they, they got the 24 million. 22 of that will be divided up between the players and 2 million will go into a pot where players, once they are set on retirement, they can go, I think it's a max of $50,000. They can go into that pot and use it, whether it's uh, going for their coaching license or just figuring out life after soccer. So I think that is amazing. But I think this is just the start of it because you look at the numbers and it's actually staggering. I mean, a men's World Cup, if the men's U.S. Uh, national team won the World Cup, 470, or sorry, $407,608 they got, the women, 110000 That is a huge, and, and the thing is, is people, maybe back in the day you can say, you know, the television rights or people tuning in, viewership doesn't lie. I mean, you look at women's hockey, you look at the Olympics, you look at the last Olympic Games with the Canadian soccer team in the final, the numbers are starting to finally show that people are tuning into this women's sport. So I'm glad that these men's players are stepping up uh, because quite frankly, these men make so much money at their domestic clubs mm -hmm. that is it really going to make or break them splitting the equal pay with these female soccer players that quite frankly deserve it. And I hope this is that turning point, not only for the U.S. Women's National Team, but also for the Canadian Soccer Association and all these uh, associations around the world, because I think it's important. I think they need a CBA. They need health care. They need maternity leave. There's so many things that these females go through that these males don't have to go through off the pitch, having babies, being able to be fully covered 12 months out of the year, having a CBA where you're protected and you're not being able to be traded all around the world so i think it's important obviously we saw it with the nwsl and now they're doing it here uh flights being put in first class proper training grounds when they go uh proper hotels when they go those things should be equal i don't even understand why we're at this point especially when you're talking about the u.s women's national team where they have brought in so much money into that organization so fair play to them i mean megan rapino really spearheading this alex morgan you touched on it so again i always go back to players like jordan heidema she's going to have to do what these women are doing in America because she's got the platform to do it uh, when that time does come. So I'm glad that the U.S. Women's National Team didn't back down and they keep, kept pressing and they kept pressing and kept going to court uh, because it is mentally and emotionally draining and never mind mm -hmm. having to prepare with a World Cup just around the corner. Mm -hmm. And never mind having the fact that a lot of these women were involved in the CBA negotiations for the NWSL at the same time, right? So yeah. you're fighting in, in, in two arenas. And, and I think that, you know, what the women's national team has done for other countries around the world is, is give precedence. And giving precedence is really huge. And that can be something that Canadian players, if they have to go forward, I mean, hopefully you other countries look at the United States and say, we're not going to fight on this. We're just going to give our you know women's team equal pay. We're going to fi find CBAs of our own, whatever the case may be. Um, but that's not always a guarantee. And, and certainly, you know, in different countries around the world where 
women are treated differently, even in, in countries where we like to think that there's equality, you know, we see these things happening. So I definitely think that it's a matter of, um, you know, precedence for other uh, nations. It's amazing that they were able to really power through here. And I also think, you know, this isn't the end. They still have to sign a CBA. CBAs are complicated. Uh, but it's another step in the right direction. At least. And I, I, I just want to jump in just really quickly because that that's such an important one that the CBA isn't um, solidified yet. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad that the players did speak up. Megan Rapino specifically came out and said, we still have so much to do. Laura, you just touched on some of it, but growing the game from a commercial perspective, obviously getting investors on board to be able to keep producing the money and keep putting the money back into the female program and then also to get FIFA on board with the mm -hmm. prize money to close that gap. So they're still having those conversations and they're still putting that out into the media world. I mean, tagging FIFA and stuff like that. Those are important conversations that this women's team, it just continues to keep proving. So I love it. I mean, as much as, you know, we battle against them. I have so much respect for these players because this is very difficult to do. They make a lot of money off field. Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, they could really go quiet and live a really good life, but they want to change the game, not only for themselves and get that back pay, but for the future. And I think that says a lot about these players, both on and off the pitch and what they're trying to do, not only for the U.S. women's national team, but just for the growth in North America. And I applaud them. And it's not just within their own federation, because while they were battling, a lot of other federations across the world started to just on their own step up and say, we're going to start closing yep. the gap between what the men and women make within our federation. So here they were influencing other federations while they were creating this, you know, this in, they were still in this battle uh, with their own. So huge step for them. But yes, you know, as we point out, the CBA still needs to be signed to have equal pay moving forward. And then the next giant to slay, I guess, would be the actual um, organizations like FIFA, who have these pots. They're the ones who distribute the pots, right? Mm -hmm. Now it's up to the federations how they distribute it between their men's and women's team. But that'll be the next step, obviously, is going ahead saying, hey, FIFA, let's kind of uh, get a, maybe a little bit of a closer gap there between the men and women when it comes to you know certain uh, events where the women have a huge draw as well there's a couple of women's tournaments going on we're going to get to the arnold clark cup in just a moment but we Abby, have to what you killed that and you said it so quick i know i I've, I've been practicing i was like i debated whether or not i go acc or <laughs> Hell, i am like i'm extremely proud of you right now and this is probably you've gotten a little bit more sleep you're not working 72 mm -hmm. hours in 24 yeah. hours so i mean fair I play nailed it. anyway sorry i was like wait what I know I did. Don't jinx me now. But if, if you're just tuning in right now and you missed our previous episode, I could not for the life of me, even if I had money on me to purchase it, I could not pronounce Arnold Clark Cup. It just wasn't coming out. Uh, but uh, let's get to the She Believes Cup first. Speaking of USA. So USA, they were taking on New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And this has to be a player's worst nightmare. So New Zealand's Michaela Moore got not one, not two, but three own goals. And we'll show you those goals. And, and I know, I, I wonder if you guys are just on the same uh, path as me when I'm looking at this. The first and second goal, absolutely no hope in hell. I mean, what are you supposed to do, right? I mean, I feel like she had pretty good positioning on that first one, gets her foot up to try and deflect. I mean, what are you going to do? That goes in the net. The second one, that what did that smack her off the face? I don't know what you're supposed to do there. Yeah. The third one, yes, her feet got tangled up use the left foot when she should have used the right and then it goes in but i wonder if at that point her confidence had been so beaten down kaylin take us on the pitch as a player and you get an own goal yeah uh, to be honest i'm not even patting myself on the back here i've never scored an own goal thankfully but i've done it in a training session and you still feel like a bag of crap about it but as a manager, I'm just looking at someone like a John Herdman, for example, being managered. And I'm not having a go at the manager by any means. But if you have two own goals, whether they're your fault or not your fault, in the first 10 minutes of a match against a very good U.S. women's national team side that is going to throw everything maybe but the kitchen, even the kitchen sink at you. They just have so many attacking presence. You're subbing her off and giving her that little bit of a mental break, being like, look, Neither of these goals are your fault, but mentally as a player, that is extremely di difficult to then go play another 80 minutes in a match against the number one team in the world for a reason, whether or not it's their starters that they normally have in or not. So I think this is really poor from the manager. I don't think this would have happened maybe with the U.S., with Canada. And again, I'm not having a go at the manager, but to protect a player mental side of that, because 
-hmm. I don't think I've ever seen three own goals from the exact same player, both male or female, in the world of football ever. And I mean, there's memes, it's all over social media. I feel terrible for her because she's an actually a very good player, but mentally, that's not just affecting you for the next 80 minutes. That's affecting you for the for your career because social media works in great ways, but it's also mm -hmm. one of the worst things in the world. And right now, probably one of the worst things in the world because it's all over every single thing. Everyone's covering it as you would, right? And that's w why we're in media because we cover stories like this. But for someone like her that is now going on Twitter, going on Instagram, because there's mean people in the world, she's probably getting so much hate. She's probably getting a lot of love as well from her family, her players, her teammates, her friends. But social media loves a villain. Social media yeah. loves to poke fun at people. So like, for me, the manager got it wrong. Sub her out after two own goals, let her sit, let her just, you know, it's not your fault. Go look at the video footage after and then let her prep for that third game. Because now going into this third game as a player, I'm like, please don't put me in. Get me out of this tournament. Let me go back to wherever I'm playing. Let me go back to my family and friends because I, I don't even want to be on TV at the moment. I don't want to be on social media. That That's coming from my player perspective if, if this was me. Mm -hmm. um, and I have very tough skin, so I, I don't know if she has tough skin or not, but I think the manager got it wrong. They should have subbed her off after those two goals. That being said, quite honestly, if I was the manager, I would be trying to get that, that locker room to rally around her, which I think yeah. they already have done, and say, get back in the game as soon as possible, right? Like, we really want you to be out, whether it's a 30-minute substitution, whether it's starting or again, just, like, exactly. showing that we have faith in you because I think that, I mean, players put pressure on themselves because they're feeling like they're letting everybody else around them down right yeah, and in yeah. those moments and you, you can look back at that game in the U.S. when that game five nothing and you're looking back at that game and you're thinking yeah she scored three on goals, goals but quite honestly the U.S. probably would have won that game like the score line goes up yeah. but it's not like New Zealand's other like you know they went down to nothing it's not like they brought it back to 2-1 or whatever the case may be the second half the U.S. had two goals it was a clean sheet like even without the hat trick they would have won so I think it's really important for New Zealand to get her back in the game as quickly as possible. But I agree entirely with Kaylin. Like at the end of the day, that game didn't matter. It's not no. like it's a very important game. It's a friendly. Pull her out. Give her a little bit of time yeah. to breathe. Um, and 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 then you know you'll feel a little bit better about yourself, you know, preparing for the next match. I felt like overkill and I really hope that people are smart enough to know that this was just a really bad day and yeah. don't, you know, go at her again and again and don't bring this up throughout the rest of her career. Um, but I unfortunately, you know, you also know social media and that's not gonna be the case. No. Nah, it's tough. I hope she finds a way to own it. Do you know what I mean? Like there are so many players who <laughs> no have bad pun intended, days. Andy. No. That's what you did there. I actually did not intend to do that at all. That was not even what I was trying to go at. I was trying to go at like, I just hope that to your point, we're not talking about a World Cup final or an Olympic final or no. anything like that. Because we know there are players, oh boy, who have made gaps in some of those biggest games and, you know, what they've had to do to try and get over that. This is more of, you know, yes, it's a tournament and obviously you go out there and you always want to win. But I just hope that she can find a way yeah. to just, you know make light of it herself. Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, you can't make me a joke because I'm just going to have a laugh at it myself. I'm going to own that myself. So, you know, if her agent get is out of my smart, face. If her agent is smart, he is finding her the best sponsorship opportunity with this in the world. I should be her agent because I would make this so marketable in the best way ever. But like, like you said, own it. Like ask yeah. her line, own it. Like just go out there, come out on social media. Like if that was me, I'm put, I'm going on a live and being like, had a bottle of tequila, I've been through. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Just make a little bit of light of it and not yeah. not hide. Do, do, that's the worst thing you can do in a situation like this, but yeah. yeah. So hopefully she, hopefully she can do that. But let's take a look now at the Arnold Clark Cup. Woo, did it again. Oh. So Canada <laughs> with a 1-1 draw against eighth ranked England, one nil win over third ranked Germany. They take on Spain Wednesday. Laura, when you just look at how they've been able to do so far in this tournament, what's your assessment of the Canadians? Yeah, they've, <laughs> well, Sorry. there we go. That's what it is. They've entirely exceeded my expectation. I like think that Bev Priestman went into this sort of trying to like, 
you know, play, play it down a little. She's like, half of our players are out of season. We're not like expecting to go in and absolutely blow people out of the water. And quite honestly, Canada hasn't necessarily absolutely blown people right out of the water, but they don't need to because what they're good at doesn't require them to blow exactly. people out of the water. All they have to do is keep a clean sheet and score one goal. And guess what? That's exactly what they did against Germany. You know, I think that maybe the first, just like Andy, you're sort of growing into being able to say Arnold Clark Cup, Canada sort <laughs> Sort of grew into the Arnold Clark Cup itself. The first, you know, half maybe wasn't their best half if you're really nitpicking at things. Um, mm -hmm. But in this tournament, it's like Canada really has been just so steady and so consistent. And, you know, by doing that and by not being, in, you know, by by just being consistent, they are blowing people uh, people out of the water. And if they walk away from this tournament having won it while these three teams are in the middle of their World Cup qual or their uh, Euro qualification and they're in the middle of their season, that's a huge, huge win for the Canadian team. I love, 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 love that you said that. They're <clears throat> growing into this tournament. I'm not even going to try to say that because everyone knows I can barely speak English on a good day. Um mm -hmm. But the one thing that Canada is doing in these tournaments, and we saw it at the Olympics, is they're grinding out results. Mm -hmm. And that adds so much fuel to their, their I'm going to screw up that saying, so I'm not even going to say, I was going to say fuel to their cylinder. I don't even think that is a saying. Fuel to the fire? Fuel to the fire. That's the one. <laughs> That's the one that I, I was thinking like this cylinder that you put the gasoline in. I don't even think it's called that. Anyway, gas tank. But I just think with what they're doing, they are growing the mental side of their games. And it doesn't matter if they're in season, they're out of season, they have youth players starting, they're without Christine Sinclair, they're without Adriana Leon. These players are like, we've just beat Germany. We've just, we're flying through this tournament, quite frankly, one of the best tournaments with the best teams right now. This used to be the She Believes Cup. This, I think that now the She Believes Cup, Cup is a second tournament mm -hmm. as opposed to this because this has better quality. Now they're going up uh, against a, a very good Spain. I mean, they just have so much quality in here and they're getting results. I mean, I I was skeptic before the Olympics. I was mm -hmm. vocal before it. I was skeptical before this tournament. And now I'm like, I'm just going to be skeptical about everything because they're. I think that is what's making them successful is me being negative in my <laughs> head, being like, I'm not going to do it here. Too many good teams and players of a season. Like they have been outstanding. And, and like you said, didn't start the first half great grew into it and still got the result, a clean, another clean sheet. Mm -hmm. That's extremely difficult to do in the international game. You don't have to score eight goals, but if you can keep a clean sheet in international soccer, you are a force to be reckoned with. You look at the Italian team for the men's side for so many years, one of the best defensive teams in international football and one of the most lethal, which is getting that late goal or a set piece goal as well. So. Fair play to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they are going to be. I know I'm not going to say it because then I'm going to jinx them. I'm not going to say it. Don't, no. Okay. <laughs> and, and, I, and this is what I do wonder um, if I try to kind of bring a little bit of a of a balance. Like, I don't want to be a party pooper because, yes, you can look at it from two sides, right? You can look at it from the Canadians are finding ways to win no matter what, right? You can go into they're not in season. You can also say uh, some of the players are not here. But you can also say they're not scoring a tremendous amount of goals, but defensively they're strong. But then I have another problem with, but isn't scoring goals been the Achilles heel for the last couple of years and their win over Germany, it's Vanessa Gilles who gets the goal. Like you can look at it in a positive. You can always find a glass half full, but you can always go, well, wait a second. This can be a glass half empty. But I wonder now, Bev Priestman, to your point, Kaylin, has accepted the fact that maybe this is an opportunistic squad. Maybe it is about playing that strong defense and then looking for the opening. I think she has to, though, because yeah. no one has stepped up for Christine Sinclair's role yet. Jordan Heidema hasn't. Adriana Leon is, yes, if she comes off the bench, she's always a very strong uh, a finisher in a game. But there's really no one that is that goal-scoring threat where you mm -hmm. think, when they're on the pitch, just get them the ball and they'll put the ball into the back of the net. And sometimes that takes time. It takes confidence. And, and maybe this team, too, is a little bit in their own head saying, Oh God, if could we all talk about it, the whole media talks about it, the broadcast talks about it, that is their Achilles heel. So when you read so much about it, you train so much on it on the training pitch, sometimes it just doesn't work and then it gets frustrating. So again, if this is their way to grind out results right now, how mm. exciting is it going to be when it finally clicks for someone? When it finally clicks for a Jordan Heidema that's starting to get playing time at PSG and putting the ball into the back of the net, she comes into the national team oozing confidence and it's just fun mm. out there. 
she knows she's going to score a goal. That takes time. I mean, we were, we're lucky with Christine Sinclair. It's like mm. same with the U S women's national team with Abby Wambach. Alex Morgan stepped up straight away when Wambach left. We haven't had that yet in mm -hmm. Canada. And I feel like it's going to come. We had it with Melissa Tancredi um, before she retired. She always knew how to score a goal. We always knew if we needed something from her, if Sinky wasn't on the pitch, we knew Tank would get the job done. I don't think Canada has that yet, but it will be scary once someone starts stepping up for them. So one, of, one of the things Bev Priestman said too, like going into this was we are implementing metrics that are we think are going to help us score goals, but that is not going to happen at this tournament. We are, we've, we're just starting this process. We're just starting this new cycle and it's going to take time. And one of the things that I think you can say about this Canadian team is, Bev Priestman would be the first one to tell you they weren't the best team at Tokyo. They were the team that figured out how to grind out results. I think that you can say, as she believes, that Canada has been the best team, which is a step up, I think, from what we saw in Japan last year. And that's where you get those positive moments and those positive sort of feelings of, okay, we're, cautious, we're cautiously optimistic here. Maybe Canada really is sort of stepping into that next level that they're trying to reach. Yeah, grinding it out, Bev Priestman also said she wanted to be the best coach when it came to substitutions as well. And I think we can all look at that gold medal game. And she was not shy to make subs immediately. Uh, so mission accomplished there. But let me ask you this just quickly without going too much into elaboration. Based on what you've seen then, would you say, Kaylin, because here's the next big, st big step, which is World Cup. Do you think the Canadians can make uh, a World Cup final? I think maybe audio is lost there on Kaylin. So I'll go to you, Laura. Do you think the Canadians can make a World Cup final? I think that the Canadians can make a top four at this point, and I think it's pretty much a crapshoot from there. So I, I, I definitely think that this team is a team that um, has a chance at it, and I wouldn't have told you that six months ago. So it's definitely a big step up. Okay. I think we're going to try and work on Kalen's audio. <laughs> I just love the absolute look of sheer terror when suddenly you become disconnected from the mothership. Uh, but we'll, we'll get her to bounce right back on here. But I want to just get into a little bit of a segment here. And she's right. If she joins us, I don't necessarily know how rapid these could be. Are you back, girl? Yes. Sorry, guys. I don't know what happened to me. No, we got you. I just, I was making fun of your face. It was the look of sheer hair <laughs> when you get disconnected, right? I can't You're hear like myself. I can't hear you guys. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Okay, but you're back, right? Oh, God. And then she's no. gone. And then she's gone again. She can't but you're hear back. No, she's not. No, no she's, she's not. Uh, all right. When you look at a She Believes Cup tournament, Canada, USA, and which two other countries uh, would be ideal for you in that tournament? I realized that I, I wrote down the Netherlands and England, which is like each side of my heritage. So I feel like I'm cheating. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I, I see what's happening. Okay. Yeah, that would be me. I really enjoyed that England game. I think yeah. I'm back. Are you back? I'm back. I'm back. Okay, good. good. You can hear us. It's perfect yeah, timing. Okay, good. If you had to choose two other countries to be in a tournament with Canada and the USA, the, the She Believes Cup, who are your two countries? Honestly, I would say Germany and I would say England because I think those are the two teams that you run into a World Cup. I know it's supposed to be rapid fire, but I'm not rapid with any of my <laughs> answers. But those are the two teams that I think will give you the most trouble once you get into a World Cup. I think France is still working out the kinks of once they get into those big tournaments at the, the dying ages, they always tend to fall out. They just can't get the job done. But Germany is a powerhouse. And I think England, their mindset has shifted uh, since Phil Neville was there. Not mm -hmm. rapid enough? That's pretty rapid. That's pretty rapid. I okay. like that. Can I just throw in a bit of a dark horse and just kind of just food for thought? I feel like Japan has always given Canada a bit mm -hmm. of a struggle. And I would just love to see them go up against a team where they have to be forced to change their tactics up yeah. to take them on because they even drew them uh, mm -hmm. in Tokyo as well. Like it's just they're, they're just, just a, they're a nice footballing country. Like it's so nice watching mm -hmm. them play. Yeah. Like it's just like methodical. I'm like, oh my god, this is amazing. So yeah, I, I like that show. I like that yeah. show, Andy. Yeah. That's my little dark horse. Uh, Arnold Clark Cup. Who do you think has been the best Canadian through two games, Kaylin? Ooh, that's really tough. Can I pass? Can I call a friend? Laura, you go first. You you go first, okay. Laura. Laura, have, you go I'm first. My, my list is long. I have like eight names on here, so I'm just going to point. One. You guys don't understand the concept of the I game. Think, I think Quinn. Okay. I, think Quinn. I don't mind that show, actually. Okay. I'm going to go Quinn as well. So I, the, do, I like that show. I, those are, I was going back and forth between two, but I'm going Quinn. They've been brilliant. I think they've been yeah. really, really good. That is such a piggyback. <laughs> yeah, it is. 
<laughs> um, you know what? I, I just love Vanessa Gill. I'm a Vanessa Gill fan. I love that she got the goal as well. And I just think this is somebody who, what, had a sniff at the national team like a couple years ago. And now I can't imagine this team without her. But doesn't it, it breaks your heart though, because the three center backs, doesn't it? Like imagine being a coach. That's why I think they have to go w and try to work three of those center backs into the team because I hate not having one of them not in the lineup. I don't know, I'm being uh, I, selfish. I'm being well, selfish. It, it comes down to her and, and Zdorsky, right? Because know. we know Buchanan's going nowhere. No, of course. Buchanan's not going anywhere. She's penned in. Like that. that's a non-negotiable. So yeah. play four at the back. <laughs> we have to play four at the back at all time because we said so because we like these players. <laughs> this is why um, we are not managers. Yeah. <laughs> Let's uh, let's quickly take a look at uh, the men for a second here, uh, because there are three teams still undefeated in UEFA Champions League: Liverpool, Ajax, Bayern. I think Ajax actually plays tomorrow, though. Um, who do you think is the best of the bunch? Do I get Kale. to go first on this one? Yeah. yeah. My if my father-in-law or my husband watch this, they I'm either going to get a divorce or I'll be six feet under in my backyard. Uh, Liverpool. Oh. Okay. Wow. I don't Everton. My my father in law played for Everton for years, but I, I think Liverpool. I just you look at the the race, the title race now. Obviously, City losing to Tottenham on the weekend, and then Liverpool six points behind with a game in hand. I just think that they have so much strength, and I I think Klopp is just a brilliant manager. I would have loved to have played for someone like them. So I think I think Liverpool. I think Byron's good, of course. They have amazing players. Obviously, our boy Alfonso Davies, but I just mm. think. Liverpool has more firepower. I don't think Byron will make it too far in the Champions League, if I'm being completely honest. Oh, dear. Really? I just, the final oh, eight. That's oh. fine. Yeah. They've just been like, uh, what is their goal differential too? Like, well, it's in the group stage, like 19, 20. Anyways, but you're right. They, they're coming off a draw on that first leg. Um, yeah. But Laura, what, did, what say you, Arsenal fan? Yeah, see, I'm still mad that Tottenham beat City on the weekend. Like, I'm still, you just said that and I feel angry. Like, I became <laughs> angry in that second. I was like, this is a joke, right? We're forgetting. Yeah, anyways. Um, I'm going to say Bayern because I feel like I can't say Liverpool. Mm. So, Ajax is the, um, is, a, I, is the little wee dark horse there. Yeah. The yeah. little engine that I mean, could. Ajax just keeps is a going. great team, right? It's a fun attacking team to watch. You're always going to get goals for them. But realistically, mm. once they get further in, I think, uh, again, they're going to struggle when they go up against a team that can counteract exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. But I think they're a great team. But I'm going Liverpool. My dog, again, he's going crazy. This has been a terrible broadcast. He's an Ajax fan. Time. He's really so mad. Scary. Maybe he's agreeing with you. I don't know. Um, our furniture delivery coming. I'm going to turn this way so you guys can see my furniture. What is happening? I'm expecting like an Uber order next. Um, it's just, this is my life. This is how everything rolls, you know? Oh, geez. Uh, Neymar dropped a juicy one on us, ladies. He said he'd love to play in America, you yeah. know. Uh, so, of course, we're assuming MLS. Where else is he going to play? Um, after finishing at PSG. So here's the thing. What in, I mean, maybe he is the international soccer star, but right away it got me thinking, okay, if he makes his way over, who would be the other international star you'd be interested in seeing coming on over, Laura? Well, I mean, I don't think that the CPL should ru rule out trying to go for Neymar. Like, at least pitch him and just see what happens. Why? Um, but, I mean, I think that the answer has to be Ronaldo or Messi, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just, it's got to be one or the other. I would go... You know, I think I would go Ronaldo. I feel like if I fall on the divide, it's I'm more of a Messi like supporter generally. But Ronaldo is Ronaldo. Like mm -hmm. imagine him under the bright lights of like Inter Miami. It would be insane. So well, me, me and my husband almost got a divorce about this last night because Julian Gressel tweeted because Neymar had said, oh, I'd love three months of an off season. And anyways, we got into a massive debate about it because Gressel came out and said, you know, but the travel within North America playing midweek. Um, but I'm going to go opposite of you. I am going, I would, I'm not going to be shocked if we do see Messi or Luis Suarez come to mm -hmm. somewhere like an Inter Miami. Inter Miami. And again, I work for the club. I haven't heard anything. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> but Messi does own a home here. He travels here every off season and Luis Suarez and Messi had both come out and said that they do want to finish their career together uh Suarez has one more year at Atletico Madrid and Messi has I think one more year at PSG mm -hmm. so both of their contracts are up in 2023-24 and that's when supposedly Inter Miami will have their new uh Freedom to Dream stadium here in Miami so I feel like that is like what you would open up with signing someone like a uh Lionel Messi so I would mm -hmm. say 
I mean, not selfishly, I'd love all three of them here. I mean, okay, get honest. both. Get both. Imagine. Imagine all of them back together. I mean, it would be phenomenal if you got all of them back together. Yeah. It would be unstoppable. Again, I obviously with all the laws and everything in the MLS, I don't think maybe you probably could. Um, but mm. it, would, it would be cool to see. And I yeah. would love to be here covering the team when that happens. So and I know to the regular folk like us, there might be some people rolling their eyes, but this has really been a thorn in the side of a lot of these players even coming on over is the fact that they don't have the charters and they've been traveling commercial, but we know that that's changed. Like the pandemic has forced a lot of teams now so, to go charter. And that looks like it's going to stay. And I trust me, if you're Cristiano Ronaldo, are you seriously just hopping on an Air Canada flight well, sitting in a Like it ain't going to happen, people. Two, two stories with this. I was actually, I talked to my father-in-law about this and he said, it's crazy because he's a coach for Minnesota United. He's like, it's crazy what charter flights does. It takes five hours of a travel day out by literally going on your own aircraft, the not having that contact with people with all the COVID and people getting sick. When we were at Orlando, Kaka was sitting middle seat economy at the back it, it Dude, rolled 33, middle seat. Kaka. Yeah. Like it, it that that just doesn't make sense. Like you know what I mean? But there is some owners in the MLS that don't want to pay that bill uh, of the private, which I mean at the end of the day, get on or get off. But these players should not be traveling economy. If we want to get the best quality in mm -hmm. the MLS, that is like a non-negotiable. And yeah. I think talking to a few managers, it, it, it again, it just makes for better quality football matches because of the fact that it's shaving mm -hmm. so much travel time off. Yeah, and I can say, so Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, they've been trying for years because yeah. they own the Toronto Maple Leafs, Toronto Raptors. And they said, how is it that we have these two pro teams traveling charter and Toronto FC isn't. Crazy. So they've been fighting for a long time. But to yeah. your point, Kaylin, it's been other owners yeah. who don't want to get off their wallets. And I say that because the money's there. They just yeah. don't want to do it. But yeah, now no, the they pandemic. They want to go vacation on their yachts in the south of France. <laughs> mm -mm. And, and we know when Wayne Rooney was here, he was very vocal about that. It was a couple other players saying this, this should not be. And I know there's a lot of people rolling their eyes, but that is a pro sports world. That is part of the pro sports yeah. world and they deserve it. 100%. End of sentence. Yeah. Uh, if Josie, one soccer flies privately to everything, that would be great. Yep, yeah, uh, because we need our beauty <laughs> sleep when we go from one place to another. So very important, very, very important. Uh, Josie Altador, who is now in New England Revolution. So he recently said that an MLS team should go for broke to win CONCACAF Champions League. Uh, what do you make of that, Laura? I like it, and I think it should be TFC. <laughs> Feel great. And, uh, I mean, they want all the rest of it. You might as well. Like, what what else do you have to play for? Like, get another star on your jersey or be the first team to win CONCACAF? Yeah. Like, it's a huge tournament. And Josie Altor, like, he spoke about this. I was on that press uh, press com or conference call when he uh, was introduced in New England, and he said, you know, it's important that MLS gets looks. You know, it's huge for the city. He would be cheering for any club that gets to a CONCACAF final, gets to the Club World Cup, right? That just brings eyeballs to and a sense of legitimacy to this league that, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't really have right now. So I yeah. think I think that would be huge. Uh, and I completely agree with you because you look at the MLS and, and a lot of people saying it's a retirement league, and I think that conversation has completely changed. Mm -hmm. He made a great point, though. It's not like you're getting relegated. There's no league for you to go down to. So take just an X on the season with league, mm -hmm. focus on the champions, um, mm -hmm. and then get into that Club World Cup. I mean, you look at Chelsea and Palmeiras, that, the final that just happened. How cool would it be to have an MLS team representing mm -hmm. to get more global eyes on a league that, quite frankly, deserves it because it's a good league. And a lot of international players that come over here say how difficult it is to play here because of the schedule, the travel, and just the quality that you're starting to see very transitional league as well. So um, I'm all for it. I think it's great. I love that he came out and said it. Also, yeah, I'm a big fan of him though. So like, he says, I'm like, tournament. yeah, I'm on board. Mm -hmm. Charter flights for that tournament, you guys, you need them. <laughs> yeah, we'll put that in. But you know what? It's just, and I think it also depends on where a club is because when a club has been so successful league wise, when a club has won some MLS cups, what else is there to win except for this type of tournament? Like you look at, again, if, you know, going back to a, a conversation of Ronaldo, I mean, Juventus, Mm -hmm. had constantly won the league. Like they were winning everything, but what they hadn't had was Champions League. So they specifically signed a player to help them go far in Champions. It didn't work out, but we do see other clubs in Europe where they make these moves for a specific tournament. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I can see where if you're in them, now I, I'm sure Toronto FC would like to win another cup. They want to prove 2017, you know, wasn't a fluke, mm -hmm. but at the same time, because that's the challenge. Toronto went all the way to the final and they win it in 2017. Yeah. And then 2018, I mean, it was such a 
horrible year because they went all the way to the final in CONCACAF. Yeah. And it's just the resources weren't there, right? Yeah. The, the legs weren't there, the bodies weren't there, and, and they were exhausted. So, I mean, that, that to me, I feel like is another day, another bigger conversation as well, that if you do want these MLS clubs to succeed elsewhere, does the league find a way to allow them to bring other players? Is there a little bit of flexibility with the yeah. cap there? Um, because they can get tired in a hurry. So, I mean, I feel like we could go on forever. There's so many things, so much more that I want to get to. But this was a jam-packed show. It's always a pleasure spending a half hour with you guys every week. Kaylin Kyle, Laura Armstrong, I'm Annie Petrillo. You've been watching OneSaka.ca.